we kind of ended up next to this group of guys on the dance floor. And then I think they might've accidentally bumped into us. And then one of them turned around and said, oh my God, I love your dress. That is such a cute dress. You look so great. Like, well done girl. You look amazing. And she just went, she just turns to me and goes, I love this place. <laughs> Hello, I am Kay Anderson and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories they created there, and the people that they used to know. My guest this week is Reese Williams, who is the host of the Not Another Drag Race podcast. If you follow me on social media, you'll have seen this week that I was the guest on his show, spouting my ill-informed opinions about last week's episode of Drag Race UK, and now it's time to return the favour. Reese grew up in Melbourne's outer suburbs and still remembers the long train ride that he would take to come into the city and explore queer nightlife. The place that's left the strongest impression on him is the Greyhound Hotel, or as it came to be known, the GH, which was in the seaside area of St Kilda, and which was closed in 2017 to make way for, yeah, you guessed it, luxury apartments, brilliant, just what the world needs. We talk all about taking your straight female friends out dancing, seeing drag for the first time, and we even have a little lesson in Aussie slang. Oh, and before we get into the episode, thank you to everyone who responded to let me know what your favorite musical was, and especially to Alan, who reminded me of the South Park movie. But at the same time, Alan, I have to say that I've had Blame Canada stuck in my head for the last few days, and uh, that's kind of annoying, so... hmm. This week's question for people who are listening on Spotify is a very simple one. Who is your favourite drag queen? You can answer that question on the episode description within your app. And if you're not on Spotify, just get in touch with me on social media and let me know there. My profile is Lost Spaces Pod, and I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Right, let's get into the episode. So I've, I've known people in the past who have lived like really far away from wherever the, the scene is and who have like caught a train mm. in and then planned it so that they would hook up with someone and then get to stay at their house. And that, that's the like the mission that they've had that entire evening. Like they have to find someone to hook up with to then go home with because yeah. the, tra- the trains won't be running by the time that they finish. Have you ever done that? <laughs> I honestly know I am very weird. I'm like this today. If I do hook up with someone at their place, I never stay there. I'd, I'd much rather at the end of the oh, night. Oh, that's be not home weird. That's totally bed. sensible. Like, how do you sleep next to a stranger? <laughs> like, how can anyone do that? It's so weird. I know. It's. Uh, I feel like it would have been the. I shouldn't have been like that uh, when I was younger because. Because yeah, it would have helped. <laughs> it would have helped with my commutes. It would have helped with uh, uh, maybe getting more sexual experience as well. Because there are some things you can do in a bed that you just can't do in a cubicle at the peel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I couldn't shake it. It's just who I was. I I was definitely, uh, and I feel like this might be the case today, just in a different way. But uh, I mean, I'm I'm 30 years old now. But when I was 20, 21. Even though I was always the outgoing kid and I always was the one that people just, I I never had a filter. I never, even though deep down I did care what people thought of me, somehow I couldn't relay that to my physical being and I just would end up just being myself and I couldn't help it to a point where I I thought it was a detriment. But there was, there's just always been, however, despite all that, one part of me that was just, there was just some things that were too uncomfortable for me 
And that was going out alone. That was Mm -hmm. talking to guys in bars and flirting with them. That was going to their place to hook up with them. And uh, so much so that that I think maybe when I was 23, 24 and I had a few more years under my belt being in the queer community and still living in the suburbs, uh, living with my dad, I would find myself instead of hooking up with guys in bars, I would go to uh, cruising venues or uh, sex on premises venues Mm -hmm. and just hang out there for a few hours to get my, uh, to get my, uh, what's the, what's the expression? Itch scratched. (laughs) <laughs> Probably we'll go with that <laughs> to get my head scratched. Well, well, no, now I want to know <laughs> to get what, my fill to get your fill. Oh, fill. Yeah, I see what you did there. Um, <laughs> but so then, have you gotten better at flirting? I'm always up for like flirting tips if you want to uh, give me advice. I, I, yes and no. I've, I'm I'm really happy when I meet new people. If I feel there is an attraction there, I never assume they're attracted to me, so I don't necessarily flirt and I don't necessarily suggest um, let's keep talking because I might go home with you. I'm just, I'm just a free wheeler and a dealer. Like I just, uh, if, if the conversation's good, let's keep talking. And if we're having a good time, why stop? Uh, I, I never assume anything when I'm meeting guys out. And, uh, I, I can honestly tell you, it's been a while since that's happened because this pandemic has really messed with my, uh, my ability to just go out and meet people. <laughs> Have you, have you found your social skills are eroding? Uh, no, I, I, the honest to God truth is it's me. It's not my, well, it's not my social skills that are eroding. It's my, uh, it's everything about you. It's everything (laughs) about me. I'm just, I'm a lost cause. Forget (laughs) about me. I'm just going to stay home for the rest of my life. Um, no, I, I, I don't think my social skills are any different or, um, in any way worse. Mm -hmm. It's just that, uh, I don't feel the desire to make it happen at the moment. And long story short, we only just got out in Melbourne from a very serious lockdown only three weeks ago uh, or maybe four weeks ago now. So, um, and, you know, restrictions are very slowly uh, getting eased. So um, we're we're still not back to normal. Uh, If we go out to a bar, we can't dance yet. Uh, We have to book a table and tables are very separate and capacity limits exist. But... uh, Honest, in, in a few weeks' time when we can dance again and things are, we don't have to wear masks inside anymore, I'm, I'm very happy for all of us that we're going to be able to get back to that because we're all vaccinated now. But personally, I'm not really happy with where I'm at uh, in terms of myself as a person men- mentally and physically and my confidence is a little eroded more than anything. I think mm. my social skills are probably like they always have been. Cause like I said, I've always been an outgoing, no filtered, can't control myself no matter what kind of guy. But uh, it's the fact that I don't want to put myself in that position anytime soon. And I think that's the thing that's tripping me up the most. And that's the thing I need to get over. So you feel like more vulnerable uh, I would say so. Yeah, I definitely feel more vulnerable. I know I, I probably I'm probably overthinking most of it to be honest with you, because when you're locked down in your own home and you live alone uh, for as long as we have in Melbourne, which has been the most locked down city in the world, uh, yeah, you, you, those kinds of thoughts can creep in. You, you overthink things. You might not. Uh, yeah, just in general, you might not be the person you were uh, before before the pandemic. And I think, I think that's okay. It's just, we need to be, I would like people to respect that it is going to be a lot harder for some people to readjust. Mm, mm. And so I'm hoping that's the case, but I don't exactly have a lot of confidence that that is going to be the case for me because a lot of people in my life are very like, let's go out again. We're doing mimosas at Molly's on Sundays. And then we've got drag uh, happening after that. And then we can go down to circuit for more drag shows. And I've got friends who are like, uh, let's go out to dinner on this night. Let's catch up. And I'm just like, honest to God, I don't really want to be around people right now. And that goes also for being around men and meeting up with men, not just in bars, but on dating apps and stuff. I'm just not in that place at the moment. I, uh, I even mm-hmm. had someone message me who I actually know who was like, um, like, I think you're hot. I think you're this. And it was very complimentary. And I was like, thank you for saying that. That's very nice of you. Um, however, can't muster it up right now. 
I'm definitely sexual. I can have a wank. I can get the engine uh, the engine running. Just in case anyone was not sure of that. <laughs> yeah, I need everyone to be 100% aware because I don't want anyone to assume the worst. But uh, honest to God, it's just the idea of being with another person right now in all situations, not just socially, but intimately. I'm just not in that place right now. And mm-hmm. honest, honestly, I, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't want to rush things, but... I think it's just a matter of having to feel confident again. And yeah, I just hope people, there, there are a lot of people in my position and I just hope we're respectful of that really. Mm. And I, I really hope that we don't, uh, we don't necessarily judge or hold people accountable because they're doing things different to the way people before us might've been doing mm-hmm. them. As long as, I, honestly, as long as people are doing things that aren't detrimental to their life, just let them do it. Like we're all trying to get through this this whole life thingy and for the past few years it's been really difficult for literally all of us. Like there is not a single person in this world who has not been impacted Unless you're super by rich. all of this. And uh, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, if you can still manage to uh, fly to any other country you want on a private jet and live in your McMansion, have your staff not even come within six feet of you, <laughs> socially distanced anyway. <laughs> yeah, you're grand. And you probably made a fuck ton of money as well. Uh, oh. Oh, yeah, there's yeah. that. Sorry, I don't know why I took us to this dark place. Um, <laughs> what, so what no, were you're we right. talking about? We were talking about drag queens. We were talking about having sex in a toilet cubicle at the Peel. Yeah, plenty of those stories. Oh, oh, uh, oh well, I mean, keeping it on theme, uh, were there any sex in cubicle stories at the Greyhound? Um... I don't think so. Not at the Greyhound, oh, no. Um, there were plenty of making out with boys on the dance floor stories. Um, there were plenty of boys making out with you and then offering you poppers. Um, I did remember one time that I was there. I was uh, there for my birthday and I think I did the VIP booth thing. And my friends were watching me make out with a guy and when I turned around to go back to them because that's what you do when you're out with your friends – they're all just like squealing and looking at me. And I'm like, can you not applaud me for being sexual? Like (laughs) you do realize I'd be fucking like, you don't know. I've probably slept with more people than all of you put together. This is weird. (laughs) But that's just me. So before, before that response, isn't it weird making out knowing that your friends can see you? Um, at that point I didn't really care because a cute boy wanted to make out with me because he heard it was my birthday. (laughs) (laughs) So I was like, whatever. That's not that's not the reason he wanted to make out with you. No, he was already like uh, like flirting, but then my friend mentioned it was my birthday, and then he was like, "Oh my god, must must make out with you for a birthday <laughs> present or something." But I mean, I would have I would have preferred some head, but I mean, did you ask? Uh, no. <laughs> so you don't ask. Honestly, you don't the, the the toilets at okay, okay fine. But I'll concede that point. But uh, the toilets at the GH were not as easy to hook up in as other venues like the Peel, which is the trashy, long-standing queer venue in Melbourne. I shouldn't say queer venue. I'll just say gay male venue because they really don't like you unless you are a gay male. So uh, it's a little easier to, to get a gobby at the Peel than at the GH. Oh, gobby. Oh. Are there any other Australian slang terms for sex that I need to learn? <sighs> Honestly, I don't even use the word gobby. It's just something that like trashy Gen Zers say. So uh, no, honestly, that's the only one I know. Are the, what are some other sex? I'm sure there are some, but I'm, I'm I'm not the suburban trash that I was when I was 21. I'm a I'm a refined city living uh, gentleman. Oh come on, now. you can take the the man out of the suburbs, but you can't take the suburbs out of the man. Yeah, I'm scared that's going to be true. So I'm looking it up. Australian English sexual terms, right? Bugger. I mean, that's you know, that's not that interesting. Oh yeah, like I'm gonna I'm gonna bugger you. Yeah. Uh, crack. Oh, here's one. Crack a fat. Um, I'm pretty sure that is get an erection. Is it not? Yes. Yes. Oh, well, let's turn this into a quiz. All right. Okay. So the next one. <laughs> Franger. Franger. Oh, not generally used in Melbourne, so you wouldn't know what this is. It's condom. <laughs> Okay, because Franger is the nickname for a town in Victoria yeah. called Frankston. <laughs> oh, I should have read. I should have read ahead. Yes. Sorry. All right. Okay. So Gobby, you've already said that one. 
<laughs> oh, in the nuddy. Oh, isn't that just being in the nude? Yeah. Um, oh, Pash, that's my favourite. Oh, easy. That's just a good solid make out. Yeah. Um, there was actually a song by an Aussie <laughs> artist who I don't think is even alive. I don't even know if she's alive anymore. She, um, she is alive. Don't just like, oh, she... She's not famous. She must be dead. Yeah. Last I saw of her, she was on The Masked Singer. Um, right. <laughs> so this one, Polywaffle. Um, that's awkward. A Polywaffle is the name of a, a like a candy bar. Yeah. But it's also apparently. Are people using candy bars up their cooches? No. Apparently Polywaffle is the term for a brothel. Oh, please. That's what, that's. Honestly, that sounds more British to me because you guys over there love to do that thing where you make rhyming things, uh, like sub subsequent names for other things. Yeah, okay, like but apples but and pears. Polywaffle doesn't rhyme with broth. Oh yeah, it does. <laughs> oh okay, maybe. <laughs> but we we don't have polywaffles here. Polywaffles are disgusting. Anyway, so let's. We're just just two more in this quiz. <laughs> You'll get this one very easily. Root. Oh yeah, have a fuck. Yeah, cool. And if, dear listener, you want to ever say that something is fucked, something's like something's over, something's done, you say it's rooted. Oh, that's rooted. Rooted. And then finally, sprog. Sprog. <laughs> Honest to God, I have no idea. You know what sprog is. It sounds like a term that would be used by like people in like the fucking country. I don't, not that I'm <laughs> talking down people who are from the country. Um, I have family from the country. Um, sprog? What's sprog? Sprog is uh, semen. But you would also, like, talk about your children as though they were your sprog. <laughs> so, you know, your child is just an extension of your semen. What? Like, who cares about the egg, right? Um, yeah. Have you never heard that? Honey, honey, we just call it cum. <laughs> No. Have you never heard? Oh. No, we just call Are it you cum. Sure you're Australian. <laughs> oh, come on. If we do a non sexual version of slang terms, I'm pretty sure I could wipe the floor with yours. Well, you just, like, you didn't do very well on this quiz, I have to say. Oh, whatever. <laughs> what, what do I need to do to prove that I'm Australian? Shove a jar of Vegemite oh, up my it, ass? It, God. Well, I mean, you could. I'm up for that. <laughs> Yep, you can check out my OnlyFans. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Just like this isn't part of the quiz, but I just saw piss fart around. That's a very Australian term. Oh yeah, piss fart around. Like you, you just you're just going around wasting yeah. time, procrastinating. Aww. Yeah. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, I wanted to go back a little bit and talk about you at eighteen. Oh, yeah? going out with your mates, not being gay, not being out. Um, mm. was that going to those, like, <laughs> I'm going to sound very judgmental here. Was that going to those, like, horrible oh, straight ham. bars full of, like, girls in short dresses with fake tans and men who were kind of out machoing <laughs> each other? First of all, you do not sound horrible for saying that. You sound correct. That is exactly what it is. That's what it always has been. I mean, yeah, I grew up in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. Going out on a Friday or Saturday night was going out to Orange Whip or going out to even just your local uh, hotel who do clubs in the hotels that are only there just because they have the space. And they're like, well, let's mm -hmm. turn this into a club. So they put up a few strobe lights and they build a bar and they just say people will come here. And they do because people out there, no offence to my fellow brethren, who live back where I grew up, but that's where you go because you don't feel the need to go any further out. You don't feel the need to go into the city to have a good time. It might be a nuisance if you want to drink and you can't drive in there. So what, you have to get public transport or you have to get an Uber, which costs some money. And yeah, I think it's perfectly fine if people want to hang out uh, where they live and you can have a good night out with your friends and maybe some good music. And of course, every single pub venue in Australia has a house band that'll do all the hits, like every Bon Jovi song you can think of and even Smash Mouth. But Even Smash Mouth. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, for me that just wasn't it. From 18, 19, 
my friends who I was friends with in high school, we'd meet up, we'd catch up and we would have some prees at home and just go out to the local. And honest to God, I never really enjoyed it. I never enjoyed uh, spending a lot of energy, spending a lot of money and drinking a lot uh, to be around people that don't make me feel comfortable. And that's exactly what it was kind of like. I didn't have anyone in my life who was LGBTQI. And um, it, I feel like I'm acting as though I'm, I grew up in the freaking 30s. But no, this was only like uh, 2009 to 2012 when I was becoming an adult and going through all that stuff. And so at this point, were you like, hey, I'm heterosexual or did you know you were gay? Uh, I definitely knew I was into men. I was, for a while, I was figuring out if I did like women. And so I would still hook up with girls. I would, uh, I wouldn't, I've never had sex with a woman, but I have definitely hooked up with a few girls just because I'm like, I'm just seeing where things are going. And for a while there, I thought, well, maybe I am bisexual because I genuinely thought (laughs) this is how long, how undeveloped my brain was. I shouldn't say underdeveloped, how, how a complete lack of understanding of how, uh, a person is uh, LGBTQI, I thought we were just naturally wired to be that way. And uh, if you eventually find out that you don't like the opposite sex, good, that's fine. I understood what what being gay meant. I just genuinely thought I had to be someone who liked women. And looking back, that sounds ridiculous because no, I don't. No, I do not. I absolutely do not, but... So it wasn't like a shame thing. Like it wasn't like, oh, no, I can't be gay. It was just like, a, well, of course I'm going to be heterosexual. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, it was, it was, there was definitely a lot of shame in it because I had no reason to believe it was okay to be a man who likes men, despite my only exposure to it being Will and Grace, which I still maintain is one of the uh-huh. greatest shows of all time, not just because of what it did for the queer community, but just because it's a great show. Um that was literally my only exposure to anything not heterosexual. And growing up, I really did, it was pretty clear that people thought I was. And so every single time someone accused me of it, part of me had to be like, well, I have to defend myself and say I'm not because apparently being gay, which means you're different, means automatically it's a bad thing. There's a negative connotation Mm -hmm. to it. And I had absolutely no reason, no reason at all to believe that it could be a, pos- a positive thing. So if I did like men, eventually I'd have to find my way to accepting that. But I still wanted to like women. But that, honey, that ain't happening. It hasn't been happening for a while. <laughs> yeah. So in this, like, first going out onto the queer scene, mm. like, had you come out at this point? Or was it like a secretive thing, like, I'm just going to go and investigate? Uh, a little bit, uh, I think I was maybe out to some friends, but I didn't come out to my dad until the night of my 21st birthday party. So was that because you were very drunk or was it because you were like, it's my birthday and you have to be nice to me? (laughs) I mean, I don't think I was thinking about that uh, at the time, but it is, it is a good time to come out. People have to be nice to you on your birthday. (laughs) No, honestly, um, I had some gay friends actually come to my birthday party that night. And um, Ah, even on the way home, my dad was talking about how um, friendly they were and uh, he knew that they were friends Did he do it in inverted commas like, oh, they're very friendly? (laughs) (laughs) No, honestly, he might have made that connection. I'm I'm not even sure, but uh, I just said they're my friends from Twitter and back then he had no idea what that meant Mm -hmm. at all. (laughs) So, um, I mean, I had friends from all all over the place that he never met, friends from university, friends from high school, friends from just around. Um, so yeah, it, it wasn't that much of a leap to have friends who were gay, who were at my birthday party, but, uh, no, I came out that night because I I don't know. I just, something happened in me where I was like, wait, my gay friends did come to my birthday. People seemed to enjoy them. They got along with my dad. My dad was, uh, very complimentary. I don't know. I just, at the end of the night, I was just sitting at home and he was tidying up and I just sat down and I was a bit emotional and he wanted to ask what was wrong. But, and then I just said, all right, fine, fuck it. I'll just do this thing where I tell him that I'm gay. And he was extremely accepting. And I think he acted maybe more shocked than he was. (laughs) But um, I also don't think he thought about it that much. I think he just knew me as me. And I think that a lot of parents, I've heard a lot of stories about parents 
having that with relationship with their children where they're just like, oh, if, if I think about it, yeah, they probably are queer, LGBTQI, maybe they're this, maybe they're that, but they don't really think about it because mm-hmm. they just know their children to be who they are. Um, so, yeah, I don't think – he might have been a little shocked at, because he hadn't had to really think about it, but – uh, yeah, I mean, he gave me a big hug and that was kind of it. I didn't really have a big coming out to anyone else in my life. I don't think I even came out to my friends. Uh, I think they just knew. Mm-hmm. And eventually when I started inviting them to gay bars, <laughs> that was probably the, the moment off. they thought, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've completely derailed. The question I was asking was about like the first time going out onto the scene. Was that like a secretive, ooh? Yes. Ah, so what was the first, like, do you remember the first time you went somewhere? I remember uh, the first time I actually stepped foot into a gay bar might have been, it might not have been the GH actually, it might have been Circuit, which is a club that still exists on Smith Street, Collingwood, that I actually live very decent walking distance from nowadays. So we've come full circle. But uh, I was actually hosting a gig uh, at the bar next door called Yaya's. Uh, I was hosting a gig because I was doing music at uh, at uni. So uh, that night, I think everyone that I was in class with had left. The, the night was kind of wrapping up. It wasn't really the show anymore. It was back to normal Yaya's. And I just was like, fuck it. I just walked into the gay bar and I had a few guys talk to me and that was weird because I was like, okay, what do they want? <laughs> which I understand at the time is uh, understandable for someone so inexperienced, but no, it's probably just meant that they wanted to say hi or they thought you were cute and they wanted to fuck. <laughs> Either way, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that was pretty much my – I think that was my first time. It's just that it wasn't anything because I, I don't really remember doing much other than having a drink and talking to some guys, but I wasn't there for very long at all. But the first time I went to the GH was definitely a bit more secretive I was actually kind of shocked at how great a venue it was because remember this was post renovation. Um, it was very large. It had a lot of chill areas with lounges. Like you go upstairs and there's lounges everywhere and seats and an upstairs cocktail bar and a VIP section that o- that overlooked the main dance floor and the big stage where they did all the drag shows. And I just I, I'd never seen drag queens before, and I didn't even expect for that to be a thing, if that makes totally any sense whatsoever. I didn't think gay clubs would necessarily focus on that, to be honest with you, which is stupid. But you knew what a drag queen was. Yes, I knew what a drag queen was and I knew that there was a show that all of my gay friends were obsessed with called RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> they were the ones who were like, oh, my God, drag race this, drag race that. And because I was, even though I was gay, I wasn't uh, limp wrist gay, I thought I was better because I didn't watch that show. Um, what a fool I was for thinking that I was any way better than any other person in general, but that I could be a better gay man for not watching RuPaul's Drag Race, uh, the greatest show of all time. Oh, isn't that interesting? Because like when you were talking about Will and Grace before, I remember when Will and Grace came out, I was a bit like, oh, Jack is just such a stereotype. I just don't, like, I just can't get on board with this. <laughs> and so I've never watched Will and Grace. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Have you had many people say uh, when you say that, oh, you should check it out because of this or this or this? Like have people tried to convince you? No, I think people recognise how stubborn I am. (laughs) Okay, moving on then. (laughs) Because I think the other thing, like it wasn't just like because Jack was so like stereotypically gay. I think it was because I had this perception that Will was sexless and that actually both of them were sexless and I was a bit like, well, what the fuck is the point? Oh, I can I can understand that. I think um, considering it was a half hour sitcom, there wasn't a lot of sex um, in general. Like even Grace, uh, when she had a sex life, you didn't really see much of it. I think you did a little bit. I remember one relationship in particular was pretty sex based, but um, like with with Jack and and Will. Well, Jack would always joke about the many men he slept with and the many boyfriends he had. And Will was more of a relationship guy. Like the show started when he was getting out of a, like a 10 year relationship or something. And um, he, he was definitely more the straight gay man. So I do understand why some people might be like, uh, there's not a lot of value in it. But I think just the fact that there was such an extremely successful popular show like that, that did feature a gay man who was the more cliche homosexual 
that people kind of character caricaturize. Is that even a word? I'm going to make it a word. And uh, okay, yeah. the gay character that is is gay but isn't quote in your face about it. Um, that's not a quote I would use. That's a quote dumb people would use. So I understand <laughs> that some people might be a little. I don't know. I, I there's there's a lot of hesitation. I think about the way it represents uh, gay men, but. For me, it really did make me like hearing my parents laugh hysterically at things that Jack was doing or even gay jokes actually gave me for the mm. first time thought that, oh, my God, could this could this whole being gay thing not be an absolute disaster? Am I going to actually be able to live a life without being condemned to hell and live with, with Satan because my mother was a religious moron? Um, no, like maybe, maybe there is, uh, hope and that honest, honest to God, that show really was, uh, the first time I was able to experience anything queer and have it, have it be the main, kind of the main thing of the show, but eventually be such a sub plot line. Mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. people watched the show because it was funny, not because there were gay characters on it. And that's what Mm -hmm. made the show so successful. So many episodes I could think of, the whole subject of sexuality wasn't even brought up because these characters were just being hilarious. And uh, that as well. I was also a huge Friends fan and I think most people in the world are. So having a show that's kind of like Friends but also have that sub uh, storyline of diversity uh, which is a word I don't. Even, I don't even think I knew that word <laughs> when I was younger, watching Will and Grace. But um, yeah, it's it's it was such a, a great comfort for me. It was that's what it was. It was a comfort show, while also being wildly hilarious. So I do recommend giving it a go. But I'm not going to force anyone to watch anything because I've been one of those people. <laughs> I am one of those people who constantly have people saying, "I can't believe you've never seen Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones," and I'm like, "Bitch, I don't want to." <laughs> The the whole thing about TV discovery and music discovery and all that, it's so interesting that we like, there are some people that you'll listen to the recommendations from, there's some people that you won't, there's this kind of weird thing where you're like, I, I want to discover things on my own. And so like, if someone suggests something to you, you're like, no, I'm just not interested. Like that just puts you off something rather than encourages you to watch it. 100%. And then, like, 15 years after something's been big, suddenly you'll discover it and it will be like, oh, why didn't anyone tell me about this? And then all your friends are like, mm, kind of did. <laughs> yep, very much so. Uh, so anyway, so drag queens. This was your first time seeing a drag queen. So what was yeah. the response? Uh, honestly, I mean, I really did like it. I was entertained. And that's the whole reason drag queens exist. It's to entertain you and, and uh, do so without adhering to traditional entertainment uh, structures. It's to do so by, uh, by shocking you, by introducing camp, by introducing uh, a whole other realm of uh, ways to entertain people that you kind of aren't supposed to get away with, but nowadays you kind of do because drag is so popular now, probably thanks to a show like RuPaul's Drag Race. And um Honestly, I just remember being entertained and being so like, "This is great." I didn't think I, I didn't think I would love it as much as I do today. But back then, going to a gay bar and seeing a drag queen became the exciting thing to do. It became something I was excited to show my friends, like my girlfriends who live in the suburbs. I remember the first night I asked them, "Do you want to go to the GH? It's this it's this club that I love, and I think you'd have a good time." They were down to go into the city. I was just like, let's go. Instead of going to fucking Crown, which is where all the suburban people go when they want to go into the city. or um, Which is the casino, we need to say. Yes, the, the, the big casino owned by James Packer, who's that recently got into a lot of trouble for breaking a lot of laws. So <laughs> there's that. But uh, if we want to, you know, spread our wings a little bit, try something different, I'd love to take you to GH and you guys can see what a gay club is like and see a show because they do shows and that was exciting because no bar that they went to ever did shows. If what The only shows they saw were the fucking cover band doing Bon Jovi every fucking <laughs> night. So And Smash Mouth. And Smash Mouth. <laughs> but uh, I remember the, the moment I was waiting for them to get ready and they were just like, all right, we'll go. And I'm like, yes. And not kidding you, as soon as we walked in, they were a little miffed about the fact they had to pay entry. GH were a little annoying with the fact that you had oh. to pay, I think, $20 entry. Twenty dollars. 
shit. Yes, that was the big ugh of uh, of going there. But I remember distinctly my one of my friends wore like a really great dress that she bought for her sister's birthday. She was like, I want to wear this out because it's a great dress. And uh, we all, we got our drinks, went straight to the dance floor. It was still kind of early-ish. It wasn't packed. It ended up getting a lot busier. But um, we kind of ended up next to this group of guys on the dance floor. Uh, and then I think they might have accidentally bumped into us. And then one of them turned around and said, oh, my God, I love your dress. That is such a cute dress. You look so great. Like, well done, girl. You look amazing. And she just went, she just turns to me and goes, I love this place. <laughs> that was all it took. And I'm like, yeah, this is this is one of those places. That's literally all it took. They had a drink in their hand and they got a massive compliment. That's all they needed. And then they stuck around and we watched the shows. We watched the drag queens. We watched the boylesque. And that was really something they had never experienced before either. And I just felt so, I just felt relieved that, my first time I went to this place with my f- my friends who knew me when I was 15 and probably clearly homosexual but wasn't allowed to say anything because we went to a Christian school, there's an added caveat, um, that they were enjoying themselves and it was it was just so refreshing and so, like, I could exhale a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, do you remember hearing about the Greyhound closing? I do. Um, honestly, it, it wasn't surprising in the slightest because – the events that led to it were really disappointing. Um, the the club that I experienced for many years in my early twenties wasn't the club that it was anymore. Uh, it it did change ownership, and uh, that ownership, uh, to my knowledge, were not uh, LGBTQI persons. Um, they just, they saw it as a business transaction, and that kind of bled into the life of the club. They had uh, removed the DJ who had been there for many, many, many years, every Friday night and usually on Saturdays as well. Um, They had completely changed uh, the entertainment. Uh, Also the entertainment itself had changed hands. Uh, And the show, um, the show wasn't what it used to be. Um, They, it was, there was no drag queens a part of it, which was disappointing because the GH was a great opportunity for drag artists to, uh, to gain some experience. Um, they had a smaller room at the front, which when the club was open was an R&B room and that was sick. But um, on other nights during the week it would be bingo or it would be uh, the other shit that drag queens do, <laughs> <laughs> the other games that drag queens do. Um, I just loved seeing that that great talent on stage at the GH. It was such a huge stage as well and um, it, it just was uh, a great place to, to get to know your local queens and, to have that removed so that a bunch of boys in um, uh, scantily clad outfits uh, could do some more dance routines. And at one point even, I remember, I think it might have been one of the last times I went to the GH. Uh, Some friends of mine went because we usually do. And um, for some reason the Boy Lesh show turned into an acoustic number. Uh, One of the guys played a guitar. Another guy sat on stage in... Um, shirtless but with a tie on and they just did an acoustic rendition of a David Guetta song. I think it was Titanium. And um, I just was like, what exactly is this? Um, Good for you for trying new things. It's been a few years. You want to refresh your show. Who am I to say you can't refresh and change things up and try things and see what the audience thinks? Of course you should do that. Um, But you're ignoring the very community that kept that club strong, even with a $20 entry fee, even with it being uh, a pretty, well, not far out from the city. St Kilda is pretty close to the city, but um, not as close as other queer clubs uh, in the city that people would go to purpose. They would go to that area of Melbourne to go to the GH. It really was disappointing to see so many changes and to see it pretty clearly in the in the crowd, it wasn't as busy as it used to be. And when the news came that it was closing down, and it was it was sold to a developer who ended up putting up a bunch of apartments. Um, to this day, I don't think I've gone to that intersection in St Kilda where the GH was. I think the apartments have been done for a while, but I've never seen them. I don't have no business going to St Kilda because I live north of the river. Mm. But um, I. It, it just, it wasn't surprising at all. And it was so disappointing that that was the end of that 
iconic venue, not just an iconic venue for the community of Melbourne, like an iconic nightclub. It was used in music videos. It was used like it was used in a Killing Heidi music video. Um, it was uh, used for a lot of television. It's just um, that was one thing, but the queer community really found itself in that venue and a lot of queer people found themselves in that venue and I'm one of those people. Mm. And it was just really disappointing that um, that's how that story had to end and we eventually found our way elsewhere and went to uh, north of the river to Smith Street and uh, that's where so many of the iconic clubs exist now. And uh, I, I'm sure there are plenty of young uh, gay people in this city who never even heard of the of the GH, the Greyhound, and uh, don't understand <clears throat> how incredible it was. Um, but unfortunately, that's just the way life goes, and these spaces apparently can't last forever. Mm-hmm. So to round up, to round up, to close up, to to end the conversation. If you could give one piece of advice to that 20-year-old Reese that was going through the front door of the Greyhound, what would you tell him? Honestly, I would tell him... I would tell him to enjoy the people he's around. I would tell him not to worry too much about the people he's around. I think part of me might have thought... Because, as I mentioned earlier, I wasn't confident enough to just meet people and maybe flirt with guys and go home with them. I would probably just tell him, this isn't as scary as you think it is. Like these are, you're not just here with friends that you met from Twitter or just around who are who are like you. More people are like you than you think. And you should probably stop thinking so much about what it means for you, but how there are other people in a, in the same situation as you who you could probably relate to and might have good experiences and good relationships with. As, as outgoing as I was, I was also a bit closed off and I didn't uh, open myself up to new types of people very often and my friend groups that I established were kind of the ones I stuck with. And I think, yeah, if I, if I could tell 20-year-old Reese anything, it would be just... Don't be afraid to spread your wings a bit more because you're already doing it. You went to a queer venue and you want to go to more of them and you want to go out on Thursday nights and you want to make the travel into the fucking city to do it, which takes so long. But if you're doing it, fucking go ham. Do it. Just go harder. It's not going to be the end of the world if you hook up with someone and then he says, actually, no, bye. It's not going to be the end of the world if a friend of yours does something when they're drunk that pisses you off and you leave home feeling dramatic, like a character on the Hills. It's (laughs) always back to these things happen. This is life. And (laughs) it's always goes back to the Hills. This is, this is life. And you should just, you shouldn't be so reserved, which is weird to, to say, but it's genuinely how I feel. Even though I have always been an outgoing person, I've always been reserved. And I think if I was, yeah, if I was 20 again, I would, I would, I would try harder to really embrace the people I was around and just, just commit to, to, to living a life that isn't filled with questions and worry. And is this okay? Yeah, it's okay. Just fucking go. Just fucking do it. That should just be my new motto. Just fuck it. Just go for it. Do you have any memories of the Greyhound or clubbing from your own queer scene that you want to share? Well, if you do, please get in touch. I want to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories. Go to lostspacespodcast.com and find the section Share a Lost Space and tell me all about what you got up to. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Lost Spaces Pod. 
Whilst you're there, follow Reese on Instagram as either not another drag race pod or Reese Boy, and that's R E S I E B O I. Lost Spaces is not only a podcast, but a concept record as well. I have been writing songs about queer venues and the people who used to live their lives there and will be releasing songs over the coming year. You can hear the first single, which is called Well Groom Boys and is playing underneath my talking right now on all good streaming platforms. If you like this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribe, leave a review on your podcast platform, or just told people who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. I am Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. Lost Spaces.